Hello, and welcome to the Black Commission's Sharing Space. Today we are meeting with a historian in Jacksonville in the movement of activism. And his name is Wells Todd. Wells, can you share something about yourself and why you are with the Jacksonville Progressive Coalition? Yes, first I'd like to say good morning and thank uh, thank all you guys, the Black Commission, to uh, for inviting me here to speak uh, this morning. Um, I'm really not an historian uh, unless you take into account my 75 years of life on this planet. Yeah, that's <laughs> what we're taking into account. <laughs> you make me that. Um, well... Oh, I relocated here to Jacksonville from Kansas City, Missouri in 2001, my wife and my son. Um, and we have always been activists uh, in the term activism, that the term is being used today. You know, back in the day, I was called a militant um, or revolutionary, which I still consider myself that. Um, but you know the system the way it is they give each generation a different name for mm -hmm. fighting them <laughs> so to speak um and so we met uh, a few people here in jacksonville who were like-minded people and um, we decided to start the jacksonville progressive coalition um to fight against white supremacy um, and and all the other things that uh, oppress uh, people of color and poor white folks. So that started uh, some seven years ago. <clears throat> and um, the first uh, thing we we uh, took on was changing the name of Nathan Bedford Forest High School. Um, and that was done before we got into the more recent struggle of changing the names of six schools that were named after Confederate generals. Um, and, and we thought it was necessary to do that and the other names for a number of reasons. <clears throat> One very um, glaring thing that has happened in Jacksonville is the demographic changes in our schools. Uh, when these schools were named, they were all uh, segregated schools. Um, and the Daughters of the Confederacy got angry because of the uh, desegregation of the schools uh, yes. back in the day, in the 50s. And so they decided to hang names on these schools um, as, you know, a, another attack against the African American community. Well, what, what my feeling is, <clears throat> is that until we can basically have institutions of learning that build our children's self-esteem, okay? Mm -hmm. That is, to me, one of the most important things that we can do um, for our kids. They have to be able to see themselves. They have to be able to truly understand the history of this country, not the watered-down version about Thanksgiving. You know, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving came about by the slaughter of thousands of of indigenous people in this country, and then the Europeans sat down for a Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, slavery wasn't that, um, you know, we uh, sold our people into slavery. No, they came over, hunted us down, chained and shackled us, raped us, beat us, dragged us onto ships made to carry human cargo, and worked the hell out of us for almost 300 years. Mm -hmm with violence the whole way. Um, and so <clears throat> we can get back into that, but Nathan Bedford Forrest was, um, like many whites uh, at that time, was a slave trader and an enslaver. And um, he committed atrocities that today would be war crimes, committed yes. war, would be considered war crimes. Um, he he killed over 300 people at Fort Pillar, 300 black folks, in some of the most 
vicious and violent ways. He nailed people to boards. He drowned people alive. He buried people alive. Um, and so this was the name that the Daughters of the Confederacy chose um, to put on the school. Okay. And we said, no, we're done with that. So we fought that. <clears throat> and uh, with the help of the community, which is always necessary in these struggles, uh, the name was changed. Um, we did radio campaigns, rallies, uh, TV spots um, to fight to get this name changed. Mm. Um, our next campaign was Angela Corey, and I think everybody here remembers who Angela yes. Corey was. Angela Corey was a white supremacist and still is, who um, disproportionately jailed, imprisoned, and um, found guilty of uh, felony charges on untold number of black youth in this city. Okay. An untold number. And we decided she needed to be thrown out of office mm -hmm. because she was committing crimes against um, people of color in this country and then we, we had to stand up to that and we did and uh, eventually she was run out of office mm -hmm. now we still have a problem <clears throat> because the person who took over is still following the same laws mm -hmm. <laughs> that Angela Corby was following yeah. and I, and I think that hurts him. yeah I think that's a big part of the issue here you know yes. Um, one was wearing a white dress and the other was wearing a black one, you know, at the debates, you know, um, good guy, bad guy, mm -hmm. you know, when both of them are bad. Yeah. Um, it's like Malcolm said, you know, um, one of them comes at you like he's for you. The other one comes at you like he's against you and both of them are against you. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to be aware of uh, the trickery that's involved here because it's all the umbrella that encompasses all of this is the political and economic system. Yeah. Those are things that must be changed. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, following that, um, we were asked the Jacksonville Progressive Coalition, members of the Jacksonville Progressive Coalition, because it's an umbrella organization, to come and join in <clears throat> taking down these Confederate statues. Okay and monuments and memorials to change names okay. to basically correct history. Okay. Um, now, Wells, I wanted to ask you, how did the Jacksonville Progressive Coalition, or yeah, coalition, right? How did that get started? What was the impetus for it to start? <clears throat> well, it was, it was rather organic, to tell you the truth. Um, uh, there were some some people who were uh, and still are uh, unionists who are in you know union workers, <clears throat> and then there were some people who had been involved in um, um, Occupy Wall Street. We know yes. what happened when that. Yeah. People, you know, people have to get uh, dig back into history a little bit. <clears throat> in this country to understand Occupy Wall Street mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and to understand the uh, economic crisis that America is in. And so basically, <clears throat> it was meeting people at different events, you know, mm -hmm. and um, just kind of chatting up and talking and whatnot. And um, that's how it came about. It was no, you know, like I said, you know, a lot of movements are organic. Right. You know? Right. So this wasn't a attachment to the former progressive movement from back in the, I would say, post, um, um, let me see. I want to say post-reformation. Post. Yeah. So this isn't the, the attachment or the evolution of what was going on in the the eighteen the late eighteen hundreds into the mid nineteen hundreds where civil rights was happening. Well, yeah, I think 
I think there is this continuum. <laughs> you know, it's this continuum of um, fighting against an oppressive system. Okay. Um, you know, if we go back to uh, the end of the Civil War, we see how the landed aristocracy, the rich white landowners, um, carried out a counter-revolution against Reconstruction. Right. Okay. Um, that set in motion, you know, over a hundred years of segregation, brutalization, lynchings, rapings, burning of our communities. It set the tone for <clears throat> basically the way we are still treated in America. So I, I want to go off course here for a second because I need, I want people to get more into this for themselves. But when Donald Trump was president, <clears throat> His slogan was, <clears throat> make America great again. Mm -hmm. And I pose this. The only time America had a chance to be great was during Reconstruction. Right. From the destabilization and crushing of Reconstruction on, America has never been great. There has never been a moment in that history right. that has brought about any sense of greatness in this country. And so what people need to do, they need to dig back in history <clears throat> and actually figure out what was going on during Reconstruction. You know, yes. there were, there were um, amendments, 13, 14, 15th amendments were passed. And that was because there were these fusion black and white governments throughout the South, okay, who came together and said, you know what? We've been screwed over by these rich people long enough. Mm -hmm. Thousands of us died for them in the Civil War. Right. Okay. And so now it's time for us to come together. Mm -hmm. But like I said, the rich people, and um, I would say, you know, Nathan Bedford Forrest had some money in that, um, and other landowners, they got together and they said, we need to break this up because what's going to happen is they're going to come for our land. <laughs> okay. They really knew it was going to happen. They knew that if these coalitions stayed in place, they would be dethroned. Their land would be taken away and they would be out of power. Right. And so they created the Klan, the white citizens council. They kill people. Um, they had sham elections to run people out of office. We had over a thousand uh, African Americans in office throughout right. the South. Right. Okay. This wasn't just, and people just uh, gloss over this era. Mm -hmm. This was the most, one of the most important eras in American history for the struggle and 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 uh, and, and safety of people of color in this country. Right. And they and they destroyed it. And they took away the vote, which we had, okay? And they've been trying to take it away ever since. Right. Okay, all of this stuff about, you know, voting rights and people are doing this and that. No, this is the same thing they did in the 1800s. Right, voting voting suppression. suppression. Right, it's voter suppression. They want black people out of office. They don't want black people to be able to vote. Right. Because they know that the relationship of forces will change and they understand that we have been the most oppressed and they understand when the deal goes down, the most oppressed will be the leaders. So weren't they the progressive movement, though? Well, here's the thing. Uh, of progressiveness. I think for that, that time period... Um, yeah, I think for that time period, they were the progressive uh, right. end of it. I think so. I think, uh, you know, I think um, <clears throat> for all that's, that's said, you know, I think uh, Frederick Douglass was a, a progressive person. He was a revolutionary, actually, when you, when you get right down to it. I mean, this guy, you know, spent his whole life, uh, you know, fighting racism and fighting for the vote and fighting against white supremacy and, and even taking up the struggle against statues that were being put up back then. Um, you know, and, you know, part of his, part of what 
he was doing, there was so much going on, but part of what he was doing was trying to stop the lynchings that were happening, <laughs> you know, the yeah. lynchings that were basically um, uh, carried out um, by law enforcement. A lot of people say, oh, no, the, sh the sheriff and the police, they weren't involved in that. Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're involved in it today. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what we're dealing with is, you know, um, something that uh, Governor DeSantis doesn't want to talk about, which is institutionalized racism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it still exists and it would continue to exist until the system is dismantled. Now, for some reason, I always thought that the progressive movement were the oppressors. Am I wrong in thinking that? In what era? Um, after Reconstruction, um, when we were talking about eugenics, um, that those were the progressive movement. They had kind of erected from the Republicans and kind of turned into a progressive movement. So <clears throat> okay, that's where I think I'm a little confused because I really thought that it was those who were the progressive who were oppressing us with the voter suppression and so on and so forth. And right, then, right. you know, in a broader sense, um, you're correct because, <laughs> because um, so-called white progressives mm -hmm. um, still had their agenda of protecting the system. Right. Um, but, but, but here, here is, you know, when we look at, um, the historical nature of this two-party system. Mm -hmm. You know, we see that they were both in cahoots to put us back on the plantation. Okay. So there's never been one party or the other that was for us. Uh, neither one of them were for us. Okay. Um, so if we're looking at one party or the other being progressive, they were progressive to a point. Right. But that point, um, when you get to the point of uh, you know, giving people land, um, educating them, providing health care. Um, that's the point where you'll see a lot of these uh, white liberals turn around and say, mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, you can only have but so much. Uh, okay. We got billionaires over here we have to feed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this whole, there's a book that was written uh, by a white woman called uh, White Trash. Mm. And the title is kind of deceiving, but but what she does is she talks about this whole period of eugenics, and she talks about it from the standpoint of what white folks actually experienced. Okay, poor white folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. actually experienced from people like uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, which this town is so amply named for. Um, who was a, you know, committed many war crimes. <clears throat> and what she talks about is um, how the upper crust of the Europeans who came over here, um, you know, also looked down on the poor whites who were stuffed on ships and sent over here from England and other parts of Europe. Right. Um, they had no use for them either. Um, these people wouldn't work on the plantations, just as they won't go out and pick pick cotton today. Mm -hmm. um, and so they ran off into the woods. You know, they were squatters and whatnot. Um, you know, but they were used um, from time to time, mm -hmm. as we know. Um, you know, they were given certain um, privileges that we weren't. You know, if you go back and look at the black codes, mm -hmm. uh, the two sets of black codes, You'll see how the rich went about doing this, just like they're doing it now. Okay. <clears throat> this is this is their card. They're the ones who play the race card, not us. Right. They've been playing the race card for hundreds of years. All right. And so this country right now, and it started when Nixon went over and opened up China to trade. This country is in a economic crisis that it has never been in before because they have hollowed out 
the industrial sector of America. Right. And these white folks are pissed because they used to be able to come out of high school and walk right into a good paying union job, mm -hmm. okay, and have it for 30, 35 years with health care and all the rest of it. I was an auto worker. I worked on auto assembly line for mm -hmm. 10 years. Okay. Many of those jobs are gone. Yeah. One of the reasons I got out of it and went to school is because I knew what was happening because I know how the capitalist system operates. Okay, so those jobs are gone. It ain't coming back. Right. And so the rulers, okay, have to continue playing the race card mm -hmm. because they know once once the majority of the people of this country figure it out, they're going to turn and look at them. Right. It's not black people who move those jobs out of this country. It's not Mexicans who move those jobs out of the country. It's not Asians who move those jobs out of the country. It's not Native Americans who move those jobs out of the country. It's the billionaire ruling class who move those jobs out of the country so that they can make more money. Right. It's all about capitalism. That's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. And, and um, you know, so, so, you know, if you look, and there's, a, there's an interesting thing. Um, people, um, there's a, there's a, there was a period um, during Reconstruction where um, there was this so-called great compromise, mm -hmm. okay, which was a great betrayal to the four million Africans who had been freed. We call it the great betrayal. Right. And a lot of white people don't understand why. Talk about that for a little bit. Well, <clears throat> during Reconstruction, uh, the Northern troops were sent to the South to actually protect the Africans who had been freed. That's what they thought they were doing. Um, and so that's how progress started to happen because there was some protection. Um, free public schools started by black people um, after the Civil War. Never had those schools before in the South because they didn't want to educate anybody in the South. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to educate black or white people. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's an agricultural society. We want you out there growing stuff and picking stuff. Right. Um, and so and so, what happened was, you know, we had Democratic and Republican parties. You know, the Democratic Party, which was the Dixocrats. Uh, Democratic Party was the Klan. The Democratic Party was um, the rich landowners uh, in the South. And so they knew that as long as those troops stood there, okay, between them and the black leadership, uh, there wasn't much they could do. And so the, the, uh, the landed aristocracy in the South got together with the industrial uh, aristocracy of the North, if we want to call it that, both white, both rich, both capitalists. <clears throat> and they said, um, well, let's make a deal. There was an election. Mm -hmm. And it was a closed door, smoky room deal that was cut. The Democrats said, okay, we'll let your Republican candidate sit as president, but here's what you're going to have to do. We want you to remove all the troops from the South. Mm. Now, now, here's the deal. They tell us the North won the war. If the North won the war, why would they remove all the troops from the South? If the North won the war, why would they allow the Klan to exist? If the North won the war, why would they allow the peonage system to exist? If the North won the war, why didn't they take control out of the hands of those white supremacist landowners in the South to begin with? So here was the great compromise. They said, the Northerners said, okay, we'll do that. Uh, you know, we're going to set our president and uh, all right, we'll, we'll remove the troops. And, you know, no, no, no big deal. Well, it was a big deal. And they knew it was a big deal, but they saw an opportunity. They saw an opportunity just like those people down here. Mm -hmm. That opportunity was to be able to re-enslave the four million Africans that had been set so-called free after the Civil War, and that's what they did. Okay. They removed those troops 
okay? And a bloody counter-revolution took place. And that's why we call it the great betrayal. Right. And they continue to betray us. That sounds familiar about what's going on here in Jacksonville. Called the, uh, consolidation. Right. You got it. Bamboo. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Wow. <clears throat> wow. That's very discouraging. As we talk about um, upper movement of black folks and trying to reconstruct the black community here in Jacksonville. Now, with the Jacksonville Progressive Coalition, how does your mission um, improve the black community? What kind of things are you all working on to improve the black commission? Well, here's I'm the sorry, thing. not no, I'm sorry, not improve black. the black commission, improve the black community. Um, <laughs> well, right. the Jacksonville Progressive Coalition. Um, you know, it started out and it still is. Um, you know, we've had this this lockdown whole thing about the pandemic, and, and we know that uh, you know that we really need to protect the community. We really need yeah. to protect ourselves against this thing, and we really need to do everything we can um, to get by it, get past it. Um, so we haven't had any general meetings, but basically, what we had become was a um, a clearinghouse, a, a meeting place for all the different organizations in Jacksonville. Okay. Um, one of the things that I what I what I thought was <clears throat> we've got all these different organizations who are basically fighting for the same thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fighting for police accountability. We're fighting to stop mass incarceration. We're fighting for housing, decent housing. We're fighting against evictions. Um, you know, we're fighting for health care for all. But we've got all of the different groups doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we thought was, you know, maybe once a month or whatever, we could meet in one general place. Everybody who's got things going on can share everything and the meetings they're going to have and the rallies they're going to do and all of that. And um, so that's what we were, that's what we were trying to accomplish. It wasn't anything singular, okay. but it was all singular. Okay. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So like myself, I'm part of the Jacksonville Progressive Coalition. And like I said, I was asked to come in um, and help with Take Them Down. Okay. So I'm, I'm part of Take Them Down. I'm also part of Veterans for Peace, uh, the NWCP, Wh whatever is going on, you know, for me, mm -hmm. um, as long as the fight and the struggle is for our freedom yeah. um, and our equality and, and justice for us, you know, where there's no justice, you know, the slave, the same, you know, where there's no justice, there's no peace. Right. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's the way I, I see, you know, um, Jacksonville Progressive Coalition. Other people, you know, in the organization might, might see it a little differently, but mm -hmm. at that point, that's where, where, where we're at. And, um, you know, it's, as you know, you know, it's hard to find places to meet. Right. <laughs> you know, in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. you know, I was uh, born and raised in New York. And um, you know, I spent 17 years in Kansas City, Missouri, and then moved here in 2001. And um, this, this is a... Uh, This is a very interesting place. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's still um, still a place that has not decisively, decisively mm -hmm. come near to dealing with racism, white supremacy, and all the other isms that um, affect the well-being of people of color. Uh, we're in the deep south. Mm -hmm. You know, people think Florida is Disneyland and uh, Disney World, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, and right. you know, old folks come to die. Well, some of that is true. <laughs> <You Right. know? laughs> yeah. But this is the Deep South, or as they say, you know, as I heard when I got here, you know, this is Southern Georgia. Right. You know, um, you know, when uh, Dr. King, maybe Dr. King holiday, they are throwing 
KKK leaflets on people's lawns and riverside. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so here we are. You know, and uh, a lot of what I'm, what I'm seeing, is a worldwide shift. Right. In my opinion. Yeah. What are your thoughts about collaborative? I mean, because you have a, a coalition at this point with various different um, organizations, grassroots organizations who have a lot of commonality. What would your solution be to address the the need of the black community, whether it's lack of, of proper education, whether it is um, lack of economic growth, whether it is lack of pro, uh, political res representation, whether it is lack of medical and mental health care. How would you like to see the organizations address all those issues collectively? What do you think would need to happen? I have said many times when, when I have uh, spoken at rallies um, is that the ending of Jim Crow didn't come about by voting for a politician. It, it would have never happened. And black folks know that. Mm -hmm. Especially black folks who live in the South. Uh, there wasn't any party that was going to come to their rescue. There wasn't any politician that was going to come to their rescue. Um, and so what organically happened was that over time, the movement started to grow. And this movement didn't just start in the, in the in the 60s, like people think. Mm -hmm. uh, this movement started, um, I go, I, you know, what I say is it started the first time one of us, the first one of us who was dragged off the slave ship, mm -hmm. uh, we started fighting. Okay. You know, we started revolting. Um, we started, you know, in, in some cases taking heads. I mean, they don't want to talk about it, but that's what right. happened. Right. Um, and so I don't think we're going to get out of this until we come to grips with the fact that we need to start a movement. We need to build a movement. Now, there are different movements out there. You got Black Lives Matter, you got um, the Poor People's Campaign, um, uh, and you've got other things. Uh, you've got uh, some political parties, independent political parties that have started up. And all because we understand that um, we have to, we have to grow our power. We have to gain our power. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't see reforms really doing anything. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, and this, and this, <laughs> this is where my old, old self comes into to play here, you know, what I've experienced. Um, so if you come, you're coming out of the 60s, we had a lot of reforms. Mm -hmm. We had reforms before then. We had uh, labor reforms. We had mm -hmm. labor reforms. We had unions. Um, you know, women got the right to vote. All these things happened, and we thought we were, you know, we're doing good. You know, things are changing. Mm -hmm. you know, things are changing. Um, but a reform lasts for as long as the issues are right. Right, as long as the ruling class will allow it to survive. Okay. They chip away at it, they drill away at it, and before you know it, those reforms are gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, women had the right to free abortion, blah, blah, blah. What, what's going on now? Okay, we got the right, right to vote. What's going on now? You know, so, so there are people who still think and, and um, I mean, everybody, you know, is, is, is willing to give this system another chance, another chance, another chance, another chance. You know, well, let's select this one, this one. You know, let's elect Bar Barack Obama. You know, he's a black man, so he knows the struggle and he's going to do what, what needs to be done. You know, <clears throat> you know, let's elect uh, Biden. 
You know, he's going to give him a chance, give him a chance. Well, there's no chance because we live under the same system. Right. The same system that enslaved us is the same system we are thinking is going to free us. And that's not going to happen. And so me is my, me, and I'm, I'm not speaking for anybody else. I'm not speaking for the JPC. I'm not speaking for taking them down. Um, my stance on this is we must build a movement. We must join with other movements. Um, we must form a, an independent political party. And we must take control. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I know that is like, oh, that's not, oh, my God, you, what are you talking about? It can happen. It can happen. And yeah. if it doesn't happen, I say our species is doomed. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people are not even paying attention right. to climate change. Okay? This thing is, <laughs> this thing has been real mm-hmm. for quite some time. Right. Okay? And it's been blocked by the capitalist fossil fuel industry. Mm-hmm. Okay? Because capitalism has only one mechanism, mm-hmm. and that is to make money, mm-hmm. and that is to exploit the people who make the money for the rich. Right. And so we're in some serious trouble, and, and we're not going to deal, we're not going to get through that um, unless the system is gone and we put a new system in place. So, um, so that's what I would say. Um, I would say we need to actually organize the community. We actually mm-hmm. should have um, meetings that actually are specifically geared towards building, towards putting policy together, towards agreeing on what it is we need to do, mm-hmm. and to politicize, in my opinion, politicize mm-hmm. against this system, to yeah. actually have those discussions. We are not having those discussions because once we start talking about it, people get they get angry, uh, they get frustrated, um, they want to shut the discussion down because, man, you know there's nothing you can do, you know, with these rich white folks. Well, mm-hmm. that was proven um, not to be true in Cuba. It's the naysayers. Yeah. yeah. And we need to find a way to influence the naysayers and yeah. get them to buy in. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and and it is what I think it's what people are exposed to knowing. Mm-hmm. And as you know, this system wants to keep knowledge away from people. Yeah, so they, you know, it's like back during the dark ages or whatever. You know, in Europe, where um, only the wealthy were allowed to read. Mm-hmm. They, they they didn't want those peasants to, to be able to read. Okay, mm-hmm. because if they were able to read, they would say, oh, okay, so this is the problem. Mm-hmm. Okay, these people over here sitting up in these castles, they're the problem. Okay, so they kept that away from them. It was just mm-hmm. like they kept, wanted to keep the books away from us, right. our ancestors. So we couldn't educate ourselves. We couldn't educate ourselves, okay. Yeah. And then, you know, um, we did it anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, we did it by candlelight. We did it by torchlight. We did it out in the woods at night. You know, we did it, you know, because we knew we had to, you know, at, at the threat of death, if right. you were reading a book or even speaking. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in a certain way. It's like, where you get those words from, boy? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think, you know, we have to do that um, because if we look, if we look back at history, I always look at history, and I and I understand that's why history is being kept from us, because if we look back at the '60s, we see that the movement that started, and you know, started in the '20s, '30s, '40s, '50s, uh, each time mm-hmm. you had these um, violent. Um, racist attacks against our communities like in Chicago, okay, in New York, in 
and, oh. um, and, 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 and all these different cities that they burnt, they burnt our communities out. People said, we have to organize, okay? And when we got to the 60s, it was, it was beginning to be organized. And it was beginning to be organized um, at the street level and in the courts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, um, I'm sorry, I always forget her name, and I shouldn't. Um, when she sat down on the bus, Oh, uh, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks sat down on the bus. That wasn't something that she just one day said, you know, I'm tired. I'm not mm -hmm. going to get up. That was planned. Yeah. That was planned. That was planned by black unionists. Mm -hmm. That was planned by pastors and preachers. That whole thing was planned out already. And see, that's what people have to understand is that we have to come together. And plan out what's going to what's going to have to happen. We have to come together to talk about uh, policies and not reforms, but actual policies that we know must be carried out in the black community. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have we're all struggling here, okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll say the ninety nine percent of us are are being exploited, but. The African American community has certain issues that no other community has. Right. Okay. And like back in the '60s, we tried to organize the National Independent Black Political Party. Um, the initials were MBIP. Okay. And um, we understood that you know we needed our own political party, um, but of course it was infiltrated, and those in the leadership were were filtered, were were chopped off, and they they went into the Democratic Party, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, became um, politicians and whatnot. Right. But we knew that that that, that had to to um, take place. You know, mm -hmm. that well, as you know, we have the Black Commission has the summit coming up, and that is September twenty fifth. It's right. a Saturday, from eight thirty to four, and that is the exact purpose of meeting is to come together and start having these conversations and start making plans and seeing how we independently can improve the black community in those different systems I talked about earlier, the economic growth and education and so on and so forth, because nobody cares but us. And we have to have these conversations about growth. So when that happens, we should be, like you said, coming together to organize, to plan our our position. It's, and it's going to be a two-year process. This is not a one-time situation, so on and so forth. It is meant to be a two-year process in which we learn how to work together, plan together, come up with solutions, come up with um, legislation, so on and so forth. Seriously. So um, it's interesting that you make that comment about, um, you know, we this is what we need to do. And I'm like, wow, we had, we said it's time. It's time to do this, specifically in Jacksonville. So um, it's, we are great minds think alike. <laughs> um, yeah. Um... Uh, I don't, you know, this is just from my experiences. Um, I will say this. Um, we have those individual separate issues, but the country as a whole has those issues, um, whether it be black folks or white folks or Asians or whatever. And so we have to have our interests made clear, but we also have to join those other groups mm -hmm. in order to push this. Because as we saw in the 60s, we are not going to be able to do this alone. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that, um, that was true and it was brought out in um, um, the big report that was... Uh, made regarding uh, police infiltration mm 
mm-hmm. um, and whatnot. Yeah. One of the things that they realized, one of the things that the FBI and corporate America realized is that the, the biggest danger was the coming together of poor whites, poor blacks, poor Hispanics, poor Native. They understood that that could not be allowed to happen. Right. And um, I know you saw the movie probably, what is it? Um, uh, the one about Fred Hampton. Um, okay, yes. Yeah. And see, he went out there and said, look, man, you know, we're all being screwed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, this system is exploiting all of us. And that's mm-hmm. what was beginning to be understood. Great. My generation, mm-hmm. that we understood, look, you know, we, and we understood it back then. What they have done is divided us. Mm-hmm. Okay. And as long as we're divided, all right, we're going to be in trouble. And so we have to come together um, and deal with this thing. Now, I tell you, I, I for one, like I said, speaking for myself, um, my belief is as long as we do not challenge and verbally express this challenge about capitalism, um, we can't move forward because it is the capitalist system and the highest form of capitalism in this country will be fascism. Mm. And that's coming. And a lot of it is here already. And a lot of it has been here as far as black people are concerned. Okay, our communities have been occupied by fascist police departments. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, The whole idea of policing is fascist. Mm-hmm. You know, during World War II, um, uh, the Germans, Germans, came over here to learn from the crackers in the South how to deal with minorities. Right. They came over. They, they came over here. Okay, to learn the system of Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. All right. And so whatever we do, whatever plans we make, if it is not, to me, made crystal clear as the Black Panther has made it in the 60s, okay, as Malcolm X made it in the 60s, mm-hmm. as Dr. King alluded to in the speech that got him assassinated, okay, stated, it is a system of capitalism that has exploited us here in this country and the expansion of capitalism, which is imperialism, and they have done this around the world. We have been in Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, all these countries killing these, killing our brothers and sisters, killing them for oil, killing them for strategic locations to protect the oil. Mm-hmm. Okay? And the same thing that's happening in, in, with, with the Palestinian people in Gaza. Okay, it's happening to us here, you know, in Florida, in Alabama, in Chicago, and whatnot. Okay, so so we're all in this thing, mm-hmm. and and to me, we have to move forward with that understanding. Okay, that it is the system that first and foremost is the issue that we have to deal with. So I want to ask you, Wells, um, in the last five minutes that we have here, do you think this battle is, like, that Black folks can battle this by themselves? Should they battle it by themselves? Does it need to be a um, collaborative effort from all nations? Um, What are your thoughts? I think it has to be a collaborative effort. I don't believe that I know that black people can't solve these problems alone. And and like I said, I want to go back to what I said earlier about the ruling class being afraid of this united front that was being built. Okay. Um, 
they were afraid of it because they knew that once everybody came together, they had no chance of being able to survive. And so what they did was they lopped off the heads of the leaders, okay? Mm -hmm. they, they killed the leaders outright. And then they started a campaign, and they started it before they assassinated all the leaders, okay, to once again disassemble any sense of unity between blacks and whites. And I remember distinctly, and I saw it at a demonstration here. I saw it at one of the large demonstrations here. We had down at the courthouse. Okay, and I'm gonna tell you something. Um, back in the day, they sent out black informants, black agents, whatever, to infiltrate these rallies, mm -hmm. okay, and to chase white people away. That's what they, and, and I saw it happen downtown. I saw a, a big brother walk up to a, a white guy and say, what the hell are you doing here? You don't know what's going on. Well, come on, you know? And the FBI did it in letters, okay? They had to break that up, okay? If they our oppressor is white. Because as long as we go at this alone, they got it. They got it. If we, if we historically know that the crackers are the oppressors, how can we become independent and um, and grow in all those different feats. If the oppressor is the white folks, you know, when we're talking about voter suppression today, it is the white folks that are putting the, that legislation in. It's the white folks that are causing the resistance when you talk about, um, once again, um, what is it? Uh, not just voter, voter suppression, but also um, housing issues. When you're talking about protesting, we are being oppressed by the white folks who are making these legislations and putting these legislations in place. How can we trust and join on with the white community if they are the ones that are oppressing us. Well, first, I want to say, um, once again, it's the system of capitalism that's oppressing us. Um, the capitalist system um, builds, has built and supports white supremacy, just as white supremacy supports capitalism. So, okay. so it's really the system itself, because we've got black folks who are, you know, you know, still, yes, master, you know, and speaking out against the capitalist system. So it's the system itself that is the aggressor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and, and, and the face of that system is white Europeans, right? Right. All the wealth. Right. But the system itself, no matter who is in control of that system, that system has to work a certain way just as socialism would have to work a certain way or any other system would have to work a certain way. Give me an example. Um, okay, let's just talk about um, profit making. Okay. Okay, and who's in control. Um, so during the enslavement of our ancestors, uh, as they, you know, the old saying, cotton was king. Right. Well, cotton was king throughout the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, this country, had it, the South, had it been its own country, would have been the third richest country in the world because of cotton. Right. But who would have been the, um, who would have been part of that capitalist system? Would it have been black folks or would it have been white folks? No, it would have been white folks. Yeah. It would have been white folks. But if we look around the world um, at different systems, um, we still see neo-colonialism. We're still seeing black leaders who, um, for one reason or another, whether they've been threatened by the United States or not, still carrying out and still um, using capitalism as the means of um, exploiting the economic exploitation of. If you look, let's look at India for a second. Okay, 
Mm-hmm. Um, millions of jobs from the U.S. have been sent to India. Um, a lot of sweatshops, a lot of factory jobs. Okay. Uh, so what these Indians do? You got Indian capitalists, okay, and they got these people working in these sweatshops, 24 hours, 20, 22, 23 hours a day, right? Right. They lock the doors so they can't go out for a break. All right. And then the building catches on fire, you know, and three or four hundred people are dead. Right. Well, they're dead because of the economic system that's being practiced. And the economic system is capitalism. And that says we need to grind you down while you are making money for us. Who's in charge of those economic systems? Who's in charge of the economic systems? Mm -hmm. Well, for the most part, white Europeans. And I don't think that if the if that system was in the hands of African Americans or Africans or anybody else, if that particular system was still being practiced, we would still have these heinous outcomes. Because unless you're going to change the basic framework of capitalism, which is the profit motive for a few people, then you got a problem, no matter who it is. And you got a problem because um, you have a few people accumulating and making more and more wealth. And so they have to protect that. And they create laws to protect that. Mm -hmm. we, they create laws that discriminate against people. They use, as we said earlier, the, the race card. And all of it is to protect their interests. You know, whenever we hear about, and this is about white Europeans, but whenever we hear about um, U.S. going to war with another country, um, they use the term. And they'll probably stop using it soon because it's very, it's very, um, it's easy to, to see through. They use the term U.S. interests. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is not our interest to go bomb Afghanistan and Iraq. It's not our interest. It's the interest of corporate America. And corporate America is run by Europeans, and the system that they use is capitalism. And so, like I said, you know, when I was, when I, you know, back in the day when um, Essence Magazine came aboard and uh, you know, some other things happened, um, and they were black owned, right? They were black owned. Everybody, oh, get, you know, black business, black power. Okay. Well, the system of capitalism has a mechanism mm -hmm. and it is to one of those things is to um force people to sell out to sell their businesses to sell their their interests to sell their and they and they do it and they do it and they and the europeans don't only do it didn't only do it to black people but they do it to their own kind mm -hmm. they do it to their own kind Here's a perfect example. You have a major automobile industry, right? You got GM, Ford, Chrysler, okay? Mm -hmm. And you had Studebaker, whatever, at some point. Well, this guy named, I think it was a white guy named Tucker. I'm not sure, but they made a movie about it, but it's a true story. He came along with a car where people could change their own parts and stuff, right? He came along with this automobile, which was user friendly, so to speak, right? This is a white guy. The major automobile corporations, capitalist corporations, took this guy to court, okay? And they won. And they said, no, we're not going to allow you to build this car, okay? Mm. Because it's going to destroy our profit, uh, you know. It's going to destroy Henry Ford. Henry Ford sent people in the junkyards to take parts off cars. Mm -hmm. to see how long they would last, and then built those parts so that they would break down, so that people would have to continue. You see, so it's the system itself that is so corrupt. But it's the people that corrupt the system. 
Well, no, I think it's a system that corrupts the people. I think it's the people. Because you don't want to have a system if you didn't have the people. Well, you wouldn't have the people if you didn't have a system. <laughs> yeah. That's the chicken and the egg to me. You know, if, if, if right. we have a system that, okay, let's say, why, why, can't, why can't this system provide universal health care? Because they don't want to. It's not, it's not financially um, savvy for them to do so. For who? For the white folks. For those who are in power. For those who are in power and who have the accumulated wealth. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're protecting your wealth. Right. All right. So a shift in the system, okay, would chip away at capitalism. Okay. How come there's not a university, a universal income for people? Because then they would think that was a socialist behavior, exactly. and they don't want to, and they don't want to buy into socialism. Exactly, because it is, it is, and I'll say it, it is an attack on their control. It is an attack on their wealth that they've stolen from us because it's not theirs. I mean, this guy who went up in space who owns Amazon, right? he didn't work. He, he's not working in those plantations that they call whatever centers. Right. We are. Right. And then he has the audacity to come back down to earth and thank his workers. Right. I mean, what kind of madness are we dealing with here? And so, and so here's, the, here's what I say, okay? Here's what I say. I'm going to take Amazon as an example. Okay? Turn it over to the people. Mm-hmm. That'd be nice. Yeah. Turn Amazon over to the people. Okay? Because you got all kinds of people working at Amazon. You got Mexicans, Americans, you got all kinds of people working. Let them run it because they run it every day. Okay? Let them control the wealth that comes out of it. But I, this is my thing. And I'm going to end here. I'm going to have the last word. Okay. Um, I feel that all the ethnicities take care of themselves. You have Mexicans that come here, work, send money back home. East Indians stay in their own microcosm of community and they build within themselves. The black community has not done that in years because we have had multiple situations where our personal wealth, our building has been shut down by white folks. I'm going to say Tulsa and leave it there for now. So I'm going to end with um, Mr. Wells, Todd, and I thank you so much for sharing your wealth and your history um, with us on this podcast of the Black Commission Sharing Space. It is so important to get input from other organizations, grassroots organizations, to share with the community and hopefully the nation. Um, as we move forward to a progressive Black community. Thank you so much, Wells, for joining us. Thank and you. Thank Paul. you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. All right.